Okay, so uh, to uh, uh, summarize what we have talked uh, uh, talked about last uh, last week, last lecture is this thing here, which shows the uh, the uh, um, the vertical distribution of the solution of the of the Ekman equations, and uh, which shows the essentially that the uh, at the surface the the, the surf surface current is uh, 45 degrees with respect to the wind direction. If we do the, the vertical integral uh, down to the, um, down to the um, Ekman layer, we obtain the Ekman transport, which is 90 degrees with respect to the, uh, to the wind direction, looking downwind in the northern hemisphere. And this is how the vertical, how the velocity changes vertically. So we have the vertical shear due to the rotation of the Earth, and at a certain point we have that the velocity is in the wind induced velocity in the direction opposite to the wind. So this is this is defined as the uh, as the um, depth of the Ekman layer. As you can see here, is this is at a 35 degrees north because the, uh, the, the Ekman layer depth depends on the F, on, uh, on the Coriolis uh, frequency, on the latitude. The huh? the yes, the button is pressed. <laughs> Don't make me uh, afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the... Uh, mm, uh, it depends on the, on the latitude where we are, and uh, the, 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 the closer to the, to the equator we are, the, the higher is the, the, width, the, the, the width of the Ekman layer is larger. And then finally, at the equator, the Ekman layer depth is not defined because at the, we have in the uh, uh, denominator we have f, and, uh, and f is zero at the equator. This is a summary. The another thing, what is uh, what uh, what is important in determining or making the uh, the uh, the uh, good come in making the um, the comparison between the the, uh, the friction force and Coriolis force is what we call the, the Ekman number. The Ekman number is really the, the ratio between the, uh, the, uh, the friction force and the Coriolis force. So this gives us to what, to what measure we can, uh, we can um, assume that these, uh, these two forces are in, uh, in uh, equilibrium. So if we do the, uh, the ratio between the friction force and a Coriolis force, we have, uh, we obtain this, which is called Ekman layer, Ekman number, which is the ratio between the eddy viscosity, Coriolis force, a uh, Coriolis uh, parameter, and, uh, and the depth of the Ekman layer. And, uh, and this, if this number is the is uh, is uh, a, a larger than one, then the frictional force is larger than Coriolis force. So the uh, uh, this is non-dimensional number, and it's and and this is very important number, which tells us to what extent we do this approximation of uh, the, of the of the for the for obtaining the the uh, Ekman solution. Why did your partial derivative reduce to u over t squared? Excuse me? Why did your partial derivative? Oh, the partial derivative is the, uh, well, you can, you, can write, uh, you can write down also, but this partial only because you don't have the nonlinear terms. It's not that it's following the, the particle, because if you put the, if you put the total derivative, if you put the total derivative, then it's the, the derivative following the particle. So that means the, you have both the local derivative 
and the uh, and and the and the, um, the nonlinear term, and then the second second derivative is uh, is uh, uh, also you eliminate the non nonlinear non terms, and you end up with only partial derivative. Okay. So this is the. Uh, And this is the Ekman layer. That's what we have uh, have uh, mentioned before. Is the thickness of the Ekman layer is an arbitrary uh, demand because we define our, our Ekman layer depth where the velocity is in the direction opposite to the to the to the sea surface uh, velocity, and uh, so the, this is the Ekman layer depth at which the current velocity is opposite. And which occurs at the depth dE is equal p over a if you look at the, at the solution. So dE, the Ekman layer depth, is this expression here, which says that the, that the Ekman layer depth is uh, proportional to the eddy viscosity, universally proportional to the, to the Coriolis parameter. Obviously, uh, the higher is the eddy viscosity, the higher is the, the, the larger is the width of the Ekman layer. This is kind of an uh, obvious thing. And using uh, the, the other part, we obtain the Ekman layer depth, is, which is this thing here. And uh, so uh, introducing the U10, U10 which is the, the, uh, the, the velocity at 10 meter depth, which is the wind velocity. We obtain this, this thing where we see that the Ekman layer depth is inversely proportional to the, to the latitude. Okay? And we, this is the wind on, uh, in meters per second, which gives the depth in meters. And uh, this constant here is based, this one here, is based on this assumption here where we assume that this CD is the drag coefficient to obtain the wind stress. So this is the, the, that's the equation. And this, uh, uh, nine, uh, this equation, when used in the typical depth, depth, with typical winds, we obtain this, this, this values of the, uh, of the Ekman layer depth, what we, I have shown you before, which goes between 45 and 300 meters in a function of uh, where we are, or, uh, whether we are at which latitude we are. Okay? So this is what we have seen before, last time, and we can see what I mentioned before, that the, um, the, the Ekman layer depth, that the uh, wind induced current velocity is something like few percent of the, of the, of the wind speed. And obviously depending on on latitude. The uh, now let's uh, let's look at the uh, how this uh, how the wind uh, uh, induces the uh, the the convergence or divergence or changes the the sea surface height in function of whether the wind induces the convergence or divergence and. Uh, this is the, uh, if, we, if we look at the um, uh, zone, uh, uh, meridional distribution of the wind starting from the equator to the 80 degrees north, for example, then we have the, the, the belt where we have a trades next to the equator, we have westerlies in the mid latitudes, and then we have finally Easterlies in the northern latitudes. This is kind of a steady uh, pattern of the wind in the atmosphere. You know this. Uh, that's you know what you know. You meteorologists, you know this this very well. But what is the the uh, the consequence of the of what is happening in the ocean? The consequence is that we have uh, divergence, convergence, divergence, and convergence. So we have a uh, 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 as we have the, 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 the uh, occurrence of divergence and convergence in function of the, of the changes of the direction of the wind. Why? Because we have, uh, we have the Ekman transport which is 90 degrees with respect 
to the to the um, to the wind direction going looking downwind in the northern hemisphere. So that means here we have uh, having a trace. We have uh, the the flow toward the uh, toward north. Here we have westerlies. We have the flow toward south. What that means that means that we have in this area between uh, 20 and 40 degrees more or less we have the convergence. So we have the flow going toward this, the, 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 this, this belt here around uh, 30 degrees and uh, what is happening is that the... So what we have here is this thing here. This is the sea surface without any, without the influence of the wind. If we have the convergence, which is really this thing, this thing here, then what you have here is that the, after some times, the sea level ha have a, has a bump. At the same time, interface or, or uh, isopycnus, they are, they are this, hey, they have their, this shape. Okay? Because we have the flow which pushes the, uh, pushes the, uh, the, the sea free surface upward, but at the same time <coughs> we, have, we have to have some current flowing downward. We have a downwind, downwelling because not that the, if you have, we have convergence, there is no way that the sea surface goes uh, ad infinitum, but it goes infinitely up. It does uh, immediately after you have the formation of the convergence, there is the occurrence of the downflow or the vertical velocity downward, which then takes this interface in to, to have this shape here. So at any bump at the sea surface, we have this shape of the interfaces because of the vertical downwelling of the vertical flow from the surface to the deep to deeper layers. So in the area here we have we have the higher sea level than here and there and we have at the same time <coughs> we have the downwelling or downward shape of the isopycnus. <coughs> so what is happening as far as the circulation is concerned the uh, the uh, we have here we have here the flow into the into the paper and here we have a flow back so we have anticyclonic flow in this this area here due to the uh, due to the convergence and due to the increase of the sea level with respect to the adjacent uh, adjacent um, sea surface of the ocean and here here we have a divergence what that means that means that we have in the, in the area of easterlies <coughs> we have the, uh, the 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 transport northward transport in the area of westerlies as we have seen before we have southward transport and we have divergence here in the case of divergence what we have is that the uh, so we have in uh, divergence means this thing here and the sea level is this way okay and the uh, interfaces have this shape okay because of the uh, vertical movement upward so in a situation in where we have the divergence, we have the upward motion and we have the, the, the loss of the, of the mass in the center of this, of this area and at the same time the compensating upward flow or upwelling in, uh, in, the, in that area. And so this is the upwelling when we have the, the divergence, we have the upwelling when we have the convergence. When we have the convergence, we have 
the, uh, the downwelling and uh, so this is that that's this is important to, to, to remember as far as the circulation is concerned the circulation here is this way and here is that way okay so the uh, the the cyclonic circulation is around the area where we have the divergence and we have the, the convergence, we have anticyclonic, anticyclonic flow. What that means in terms of the, uh, of the, um, of the, uh, of the characteristics of, of, the, of the water masses, that means that if we have the the upwelling, we have the, the bringing of uh, cold water into the surface, bringing uh, nutrient-rich water into the surface, and, uh, and uh, while on the other hand, in the case of convergence, we have the, 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 the bringing of the surface oxygen-rich water in the, in the deeper layer. Okay. So, the, uh, as a consequence of this kind of steady wind distribution, we have this uh, this shape, varying shape of the sea surface. As this varying shape of the sea surface appears, we have we have the geostrophic flow. So the geostrophic flow in this case is not a direct uh, response to the wind. It's the response. It's the the the, the 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 geostrophic flow which is generated by the sea surface shape due to the influence of the wind. So you can see this passage from the uh, from the wind, steady wind, response of the steady wind, steady response of the steady wind. So that means the Ekman uh, transport, and then from the Ekman transport we have the geostrophic flow. So we have the whole passage between the, uh, from the steady wind to the steady uh, Ekman transport and to the steady geostrophic flow. And you can see that this, with this simple uh, reasoning, uh, we, can, uh, we can explain the, uh, the, the steady motion in the ocean, okay? as, a, as a response to the wind field, as a response to the steady wind field. So this is uh, one thing. If you are at the equator, what is happening at the equator? I hope the next slide will tell you what is happening now. Let's see. Oh, okay. What is happening at the equator? At the equator, we have uh, the the uh, the the, the, uh, <coughs> the convergence. Although we have, uh, <coughs> is it the equator? No, that's not the equator. <coughs> This is this is the same thing, but uh, looking from the from uh, from a different uh, different perspective. Uh, but anyhow, here you can see that there is a uh, <coughs> the the Ekman layer, and then below you have uh, below you have um, the no, the ocean interior. And uh, due to the fact that in the Ekman layer you have all these. What is happening in the uh, in convergence and divergence is really happening in the Ekman layer. Therefore, and uh, the the steady current, the steady flow, geostrophic flow, appears in what we call the interior. What I mentioned you to you before. So, in the frictional layer or the in the Ekman layer, we have the direct response to the wind, and this direct response to the wind then. Uh, uh, feeds the, uh, the interior of the ocean, and by feeding the interior of the ocean generates the geostrophic flow, which is then this way here. You can see here that, for example, in the case of this, uh, this convergence, the, uh, the shape of the isopycnus is this way here, but then at the same time you can see that there is the vertical shear of the, of the of currents. Why is the vertical shear? Because look at here, try to look at here and think about this. 
that you have here the horizontal gradient of density. And horizontal gra gradient of density, as we've said before, is results in vertical shear. Therefore, this vertical shear or uh, decrease of the velocity, of geotrophic velocity, appears as a consequence of the vertical shear, which is then a consequence of the horizontal density gradient. And horizontal density gradient is simply due to the fact that we have a convergence and then we have this pumping of the water from the surface into deeper layers and then forming the shape of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the isopycnus. So uh, this is the, that's important. So remember that, uh, that the, if we do the, uh, <laughs> the Ekman, uh, Ekman uh, assumption, this Ekman assumption is valid only for the place, for the part of the ocean where the wind stress curve is uh, strong enough to, uh, to, to contribute to this balance between the uh, wind stress and the Coriolis force. Okay? In order to, to get the geostrophic currents, we have to move away from, from, the, uh, from the surface uh, frictional layer and make sure that below the, the friction is a secondary force. It's not as important as the horizontal pressure gradient. Okay? So this is something. <coughs> no. Where is it? Oh, okay. <coughs> now we have uh, yeah, this is what we have told before is that the, the wind has, uh, cha changes the direction going from one latitude to another. But the vertical upwelling, the upwelling can be generated also by the wind blowing in the same direction if we pass from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. Because the uh, What we have is if we are to the north, if this is the equator, zero, if we have the wind blowing this direction, what we have, oh, uh, sorry, let's, let's do it first, let's make it upwelling as it should be. If we have the wind blowing in another part, north of the equator, blowing this direction, we have the Ekman transport flowing this way, okay? But at the same time, in the same direction of the wind, in the south of the, of the equator, what, what it does, it generates the Ekman transport to the left hand, to the left with respect to the, to the direction of the wind looking downward. Therefore, in this part around the equator, we have the divergence. We have divergence, although the wind have the same direction. So, and this is what what is happening in the in the equator. Yes, can you go back? Yes. Can you please repeat the percentage? Yes. Okay. If we have uh, if we have the uh, the wind blowing, and we do have in the in the uh, along the equator, we have easterlies, right? Yeah. You know that. You know? Yes. Okay. We have easterlies, and the easterlies are blowing both north and south of the equator. North of the equator, easterlies are generating the, uh, the Ekman transport, which is flowing northward, because in the northern hemisphere, the Ekman transport is to the right hand side with respect to the direction of the wind. Okay? Easterlies in the south of the equator, what uh, they, do, they do? They do, they generate the Ekman transport, but to the left hand side of the, of, the, of the direction of the wind, looking downwind. Because we are in the southern hemisphere, Coriolis force changes the sign, crossing the equator. Therefore, in the northern hemisphere, north of the equator, sorry, northern hemisphere, immediately north of the equator, we have the northward flow 
and immediately south of the equator we have a sudden flow. As a consequence of that, we have the divergence at the equator, okay? Which is shown here, you see? These are easterly winds. This dashed line is the, uh, is the equator. The Ekman transport south and north are to the left or right hand side looking downwind and in function whether you are northern or south, northern or south of the equator. And as a consequence of that, there's a divergence in the Ekman layer. This divergence in the Ekman layer sucks the water from deeper layers. Okay, there's a sucking of water from deeper layers generating the upwelling, okay? So, at the equator is the situation exactly like this. Think about equator being here, and uh, at the equator we have uh, the, uh, the current, the, uh, the flow is the uh, 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 the flow is, uh, let's look at this, the flow here north of the equator, immediately north of the equator is uh, this way. Immediately, immediately south of the equator the flow is that way, in the, in the, in the, uh, 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 talking about the geostrophic flow, okay? And at the equator we have this, this uh, low sea level and the high relatively high bump in the in the in the in the interfaces okay so this is the situation which can be generated simply by passing from north to south of the equator and by uh, due to the changes of the sign of the Coriolis force okay the uh, let's go back because I lost a few things. Yes, this is how the, uh, the, the changes or variability, spatial variability of the wind field uh, generates the upwelling or downwelling. The, uh, but the upwelling or downwelling can be generated also by, by the coastline. And uh, so, uh, even though you have the, uh, the horizontally homogeneous wind field due to the fact that, the, that there's a coast over there, this creates the vertical upwelling. What's, what's going on? How this happens? If you are thinking, think about the, the, uh, the, uh, the northern hemisphere. This is the northern hemisphere, right? And uh, the wind blowing parallel to the coast, this is the coast, blowing parallel to the coast, then the, uh, the water is dragged away from shore in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Ekman layer. Because the, the, the Ekman transport is 90 degrees to the right hand side with respect to the wind field going looking downwind in the northern hemisphere, therefore, there is a divergence here in the surface layer. In this divergence, there is a loss of water mass in the coastal area. But this loss of water mass in the coastal area is immediately, uh, partially at least, compensated by the vertical flow, by the vertical flow coming or by suction of the water from deeper layers, and then generating this kind of uh, of the, of the closed uh, circulation cell. So, as a consequence of the, of the wind blowing parallel to the coast, there is something what we call the coastal upwelling. Coastal upwelling is, in that case, is not really generated by the, by, by the, the, uh, the special variability of the wind field by by, but simply by boundary conditions at the coast, because there cannot be any loss or gain of the water at the coast. Coast is a uh, 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 fixed boundary, and there is no way that the 
the, the, the water is lost or gained through the coast. Okay? And due to this boundary condition, we have this, uh, this coastal upwelling. Coastal upwelling is something which is uh, economically very important more important than the upwelling in the open sea because the, the coastal upwelling uh, we, we, we typically live in the coast we don't live in the open sea more, most of us <laughs> and uh, so what are people doing here they are, they are fishing why they are fishing because there is the vertical upwelling bringing the nutrients into the surface helping the phytoplankton to develop uh, calling then zooplankton and then calling fishes. So the areas where there is a strong, where there is a coastal upwelling, there is a uh, economically important, uh, uh, economically, these are economically important areas because there is a, there is a, a, a very rich fishing grounds. And, okay, so, uh, Excuse me? Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear with the first one. What is the role of the coast in the upwelling? The, the role of the coast is simply by the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions, the, if you have the wall, the, the water cannot, cannot uh, go through the wall and cannot come from the wall toward the open sea. It's a simply boundary condition. Hmm? While, while in the case of the, of the open sea, you have to have the, the convergence or divergence. Here, you have a simply boundary condition which says, I don't want, you cannot exchange the water through the coast, through the wall. Um, here is the, uh, that's, that's another way of, uh, of uh, showing the uh, this, this the same thing, the the coastal upwelling, and this is this is how it looks like the uh, the uh, this is the upwelling region. So there is a there is a belt near the coast which is around uh, uh, 100 kilometers wide, where there is this uh, this. Uh, uh, upwell water appearing okay and uh, and so this is the upwelling region and then you have here the eastern boundary canal which is determined from the from the geostrophic balance which flows the uh, which which is uh, flowing the, the the southward and then Below you have a poleward undercurrent. This is a typical vertical and horizontal distribution of the current outside of the upwelling region. And you have here this closed circulation cell due to the simply the continuity equation due to the uh, conservation of volume and mass. The uh, uh, so this is the, the situation again with the wind, but look uh, much, uh, I would say, more uh, detailed presentation. How do you, <laughs> if, you have, uh, if you have measurements from satellite, how would you recognize the, the upwelling region? Any, any parameter, which parameter you would have? Temperature, yes. Why? What, what you would you see from, uh, from the temperature? The cold water. Cold water, that's right. Yeah. You would see the cold water in the upwelling region, you would see the cold water. If you do the, the optical measurements, what you would see? Optical measurement gives you the um, biomass of phytoplankton, for example. So what would you see? Larger or smaller biomass of phytoplankton? Larger. Larger, that's true. Okay, so you can see upwelling areas both from sea surface temperature measurements and from chlorophyll or color, sea surface color measurements. Okay? <laughs> the same or similar thing what I've shown you before when we had the vertical 
when we have the the vertical mixing and uh, deep water formation, what I shown you in the for the for the Adriatic. Okay, so this is the. Um, yeah. Well, we will talk about this this thing later. I would like now to, uh, since we are talking now about this thing, let's. Uh, spend a few minutes on uh, on one interesting phenomenon what is happening in the uh, in, in the um, in the ocean the only problem is that I have to find it okay press the button okay so uh, just a minute do you have some, do you have patience? No. No. <laughs> okay, let's see. I have to find it, you know. Okay. Here it is. We, I, I would like to give you a few words now, since we have been talking about the uh, the uh, the coastal upwelling. I would like to give you a few uh, few things about the El Nino. El Nino is uh, is phenomenon which is associated to the to the coastal upwelling, to the coastal upwelling taking place along the South and Southern America coast. Uh, if you this is the south, this is the coast of South America. In the normal conditions, what is happening is that there is a, there is the wind blowing southward, the wind blowing uh, north, sorry, the wind blowing north because we are on the southern hemisphere. So the, the Ekman transport is from the coast toward the open sea, okay? Due to this thing, we have the Ekman transfer which is flowing that way, taking away the, the warm water from the coast toward the open sea. At the same time, there is the vertical movement which makes this, uh, this shape of the thermocline uh, going upward in the coastal area, and you have the cold water in the coastal, in the coastal area. This is a, these are the, what they what is called the normal condition. So in that case, uh, everything goes at uh, it uh, should be the, uh, the the area is very rich in a uh, in a phytoplankton, zooplankton, and fishing. Fishing activities are normal, as we say, or very intense. And uh, El Nino, you know, where comes this the, the term El Nino? This is from Spanish. The, the child. Eh? The baby. Baby, that's right. Yeah, because it, it appears around the Christmas time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the uh, so these are the normal conditions. In El Nino conditions, El Nino means that the, 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 the intensity of this uh, of this northern winds along the coast of uh, of uh, South Southern America is uh, is weakened. Being weakened, we don't have these, uh, this uh, Ekman transport from the coast toward the open sea, but we have something which is even opposite. There is the, the, the cold, warm water is partially going toward the coast, and the thermocline is not anymore. Um, uh, oops, I forgot to press the button. Maybe nobody knows. It's flashing anyhow. So the uh, so in the case of El Nino conditions, the thermocline is more almost horizontal. There is no presence of the cold water along the coast in the in the upwelling area, <laughs> and the, um, and so as a result of that, there is no strong vertical. Uh, upwelling and there is no bringing of nutrients into the surface layer 
enrichment of the surface there with the uh, nutrients there, the phytoplankton bloom is uh, much reduced. There is no zooplankton coming because they don't, they don't come. And so fishes are, are absent in that period. So there is a very poor fishing period in that situation. Please, what countries are the other side? What? What countries are the other side? What causes this thing? What country? Oh, this is South America. This is the, this the is, no, it's the Pacific. Pacific, so that means Chile. Okay. This is the Western, the, the yeah. This but I'm saying the other side. Australia and New Zealand. Yes. Huh? Australia and New Zealand. No, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is Pacific. So this is South America and looking toward the, the Australia and yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, don't worry, there's no problem in, in Africa as well. <laughs> you don't have El Nino. <laughs> but I will tell you why El Nino is important. It's not important only for South America. It's important for a large number of, large number of areas around the world. The, uh, so these are the El Nino conditions and this obviously has the importance also on the atmosphere. If you have the uh, the, the the warm warm uh, warm uh, water at the surface, this causes the uh, the vertical convection in the area above it. And so, uh, in the El Nino conditions, where the warm water comes closer to the to the to the continent. The, uh, the, uh, the vertical convection and uh, strong rainfall approaches the South America and, and this is characterized by the strong rainfall. So this is a very, very important and interesting phenomenon. And here is another further, further, uh, in, in further details. <laughs> you, can, you can see that this is around Christmas. December, February, normal conditions, cold water, <coughs> December, February, La Nina conditions, which is the even stronger, uh, stronger conditions, cold, even colder water than that. Very, very intense vertical upwelling here. And then we have El Nina conditions where we have this uh, warm water all around the equator reaching the coast of uh, Southern America and characterized by the vertical uh, convection in the atmosphere, uh, very close, close to the coast. And uh, so this, these are the three situations. So this is the uh, La Nina is the third, uh, the third uh, situation in function of to what extent the the El Nino is is important, to what uh, intense. But uh, why do we? spend so much time with something about something which is a relatively local phenomena. It's not really a local phenomena. It's not really a local phenomena, it's a phenomenon which is felt in some other areas around the world. And uh, there are quite a strong signal associated with El Nino can be can be uh, seen also all all around the the Earth, and uh, so this is for example El Nino and its effect on the North Pacific. So we are talking about the uh, thousands of thousands of kilometers from the area where El Nino appears, and. Uh, so the, 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 there is the displacement of the warm water. There is a, there is a stronger rainfall in some areas. There are stronger uh, dry uh, periods in other areas. The, uh, we don't really understand what is the, 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 the connection between the El Nino, which is, uh, seems to us uh, rather uh, localized phenomena, and something which is happening, for example, in the, in, the, in the Australia. In Australia, you have the you have the very very dry season. This year, for example, you have heard for the for the um, for the uh, wood fire in uh, in Australia, which is due to the fact that there is, was a strong El Nino this year in 
And this is consequence what appeared in Australia. We don't understand why is this. So we call this, uh, this uh, phenomenon where we have the connections between uh, something which has happened locally, if I may so, in one point and, and, is connect and appears in another position. We call it this teleconnections. You have heard for the, for the, uh, for the term teleconnection. Teleconnections means that there are relationships between the, the, uh, the phenomena which is appearing in one place and, uh, and, uh, and something which appears in a remote, remote areas. So the, uh, you see the, uh, uh, the uh, what are the different uh, uh, consequences in different. Uh, here is the, uh, here are the uh, the um, the consequences in various parts of the ocean. It's not really that uh, various parts of the of the of the globe. It's not really that it appears the. Uh, the uh, all over the world. It's not. We don't. We didn't find, for example, the relationship between El Nino and, and uh, oceanographic characteristics in the, in, the, in, the, in the Mediterranean. But you can see, for example, here, when we have El Nino, what is happening in June, August? If this is the Australia, you can see here that it's very warm. Okay, so. This is why this, this year we had a, uh, a very warm summer in Australia because the El Nino was rather strong and the Australia, in Australia, did response in response rather well. The same as in, uh, in uh, Southern America where, where the, 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 the El Nino means the warm, warm weather. Similar thing is in India. But then we have uh, next to this uh, dry, uh, next to the warm area, we have uh, we have uh, uh, we have this this area here, and uh, so and here is what if we have uh, El Nino in December February, this is how it looks like, and uh, and what you these these all these areas where where the El Nino has been felt. You can see also in Africa, there are areas which are, uh, which are uh, influenced indirectly. We don't know how, to what extent they are influenced by, by the occurrence of El Nino. Obviously, there are a large number or large part of the, of, the, of the world globe where the El Nino is not felt at all. Therefore, uh, you see, all this is uh, manifested in, for, in the form of the of the coastal of the coastal upwelling. In a, uh, it's not that the coastal upwelling is uh, generating this, but the coastal upwelling is a manifestation of the of the of the atmospheric conditions or the climatic conditions in a specific in a specific area. The, uh, <coughs> therefore, to to pre predict the uh, to predict the uh, the El Nino is a very very uh, a important uh, very important tool very important very important uh, uh, subject because we need to uh, we need to know what's going to happen how important will be El Nino, what will be the consequences, because we know the consequences of the El Nino in various parts of the ocean. Therefore, there is a huge international, uh, international uh, program, which observational program, which is used to provide the data for the uh, for the, for the numerical modeling, for the provision uh, uh, prediction of the uh, of the of El Nino. And these points here are the, uh, the, the 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 moorings where the measurements, oceanographic measurement has been done, temperature and salinity, in order to understand what it, because the signal comes obviously from here, 
whether we have the transport of the warm water into in this direction or the cold water in that direction, we should, uh, we should follow, we should have the strong uh, observational system along the equator. And indeed, this is the this is international pro project where where these are moored buoys which are measuring the temperature, salinity, and velocity along the equator in order to to provide these data as an input to the numerical prediction model and do these uh, do these uh, predictions. Uh, in the present state, uh, the, the prediction is uh, like uh, the one, uh, we can predict the El Nino with one year and a half in advance, which is a pretty, pretty good result. Okay. And this, obviously, this means that, the, the, for example, in Australia, they should be prepared for a for large, larger number of, uh, of forest fires, for example if they know that the next year the El Nino will be coming, and so forth. <laughs> Anyhow, so this is the, uh, that's a uh, short, uh, short, uh, okay. Well, let's see. Okay, here we are. Now it's about time to, to talk about the vorticity in the ocean. Vorticity in the ocean is, uh, you know, what is the what is vorticity? And uh, this is a very important parameter, very important uh, uh, parameter which determines which can describe very well the, the, the motion in the ocean because of the fact that the, 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 the Earth is rotating and each body which stays at the Earth has the angular, uh, uh, angular momentum. Therefore, the vorticity is also is, is some, is the angular momentum of the, of the fluid mass which stays at the Earth. So, the vorticity of the ocean is uh, defined in this this way. We have a, first we have a planetary vorticity. Planetary vorticity, vorticity means that the, the angular moment, momentum is where we are, what latitude we are at the in the, in the ocean, and so this is really the uh, Coriolis parameter. And obviously, it's function of the of the latitude, and this is the two sine f phi cycles per day in a uh, in a 45 degrees is a 0.7 times to the 10, 10 to the minus 4 second to the minus 1, and so this is the planetary vorticity. So uh, just by the fact that we are at a sitting at a certain latitude means that we have a we have a, we have the absolute planetary vorticity or planetary uh, rotation momentum. Relative vorticity is defined as uh, as an vector and is uh, defined as the curve of the, ve of the velocity which is dv dx minus du dy <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's the uh, it's a two dimensional but it's defined as the direction is the is uh, uh, is perpendicular to the horizontal to the horizontal plane and uh, so it gives the horizontal horizontal shear practically of, of the velocity. So this is the relative velocity, this is the up, uh, planetary vorticity. The sum of the two is the absolute uh, vorticity. So the absolute vorticity is the sum of the curl of the, of the, of the velocity plus the, the planetary vorticity. 
assuming that the flow is uh, two-dimensional. Okay. So this is the absolute vorticity, which is sum of planetary and relative vorticity. And uh, we can define the equation for absolute velocity in the uh, <coughs> in the uh, for the frictional uh, friction dissolution is this way. You obtain this from uh, from the from the equations of motion, very very simple way. And what uh, what tells you this equation? This equation tells you that the the changes of the absolute velocity along the path of the particle, because here is a total derivative, changes of the velocity along the path of the particle is a function of the, of the, of the horizontal divergence. Okay? Why horizontal divergence? Horizontal divergence means that if you have the convergence, then you have the stretching of the water column. Okay? Having the stretching of the water column, you're changing the momentum, angular momentum, as, as the ballet uh, play, as the, the, the girl playing ballet, changing the, the radius of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of her body. It moves faster or slower in the function whether the body is larger or slower. And this, uh, so if we have the horizontal convergence, we have the stretching of the water column. If we have a divergence, we have the squeezing of the water column, okay? This is exactly what is happening here. The convergence generates the, uh, the stretching of the water column, increasing of the water, water column height. And here we have a divergence and we have a squeezing of the of the water column. So obviously this has to be multiplied by 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 uh, absolute absolute vorticity. And uh, so this is the, this is how we interpret physically the uh, the, the the vorticity vorticity equation in the frictional in the frictionless uh, uh, fluid. Okay? If you have the, if you do have the, the, the friction, if you consider the friction, then on the right hand side you have to have a wind stress curve. Okay? Because the wind stress curve is the, which generates the, uh, the, 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 the stretching or squeezing of the water column, convergence or divergence. Wistress curl, why Wistress curl? We have mentioned that before. We have, when we talked about, you remember when we talked about the, uh, the spatial, uh, the spatial uh, variability of the wind, this spatial variability of the wind uh, results in the Wistress curl, right? If you have, for example, the spatial variability of the wind stress curve, the wind doesn't change, doesn't change the, the direction, but it changes the magnitude. In that case, the wind stress curve is here, for example, for this specific case, the wind stress curve is positive. And what we have here, we have, uh, here is the, the, the Ekman transport is larger than here. Okay, so we have divergence here. Having divergence here for this specific case, <coughs> we have uh, having divergence in this specific case, we have uh, du dx plus dv dy. It has to be positive, and on the other hand, we have the, the Winstress curl positive. And so we have a divergence. Uh, we have this, uh, we have divergence, and we have the stretching of the water column. And they say that the the t uh, changes and becomes uh, becomes uh, divergence. Having divergence is this thing here, right? We have the stretching of the water. Sorry, we have the stretching of the water column. 
this one here. This from here is the distance divergence. So we have the stretching of the water column. We are adding the, the, the vorticity. Therefore, in the case we have in the friction, in the, in the ocean where we have the friction, we have to include the wind stress curve. Okay? Because wind stress curve is the one which determines the, uh, the, um, the, um, the changes of the, of the vorticity, of the absolute vorticity in the ocean. Oh, here is the, here is the, here is the, the thing which explains the vorticity. Here is the current. And in this case here, the, uh, the vorticity here is positive, right? Because if you use, apply the uh, right-hand side rule, the, 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 the vector, the, the vorticity vector is from here toward up, and so it's positive. In this case here, right-hand rule thumb is down, and then we have a negative vorticity. So we have the horizontal shear, we have the horizontal shear, which is similar to this thing here. Here is the, the positive curve in the wind field as the positive curve in the current field. So we have, uh, here is the, the vorticity, relative vorticity is positive, and here a vorticity, a relative vorticity is negative. Okay? This is something, I mean, this can be, this is simply due to the horizontal shear. But, vorticity, vorticity can be generated also, as we have seen before, you remember the, 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 the steady wind distribution over the, the world globe. We have the, uh, the, the easterlies, and we have the westerlies, okay, in the in the in the ocean, uh, in the atmosphere. Here, what we have here, we have here. The the wind stress curve is negative because looking doing the uh, the applying the right hand hand right hand thumb rule. We have the, uh, the the thumb is looking into the blackboard, right? So here is the, the 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 wind. In this specific case, the wind impacts the negative vorticity. By impacting the negative vorticity, it's uh, it's uh, it's doing this thing here, generating the the, the convergence. Okay, so you know. Now we can s interpret what I have told you before, simply in terms of the of the Ekman transport. We can all these things interpret in terms of the vorticity conservation, in terms of the vorticity equation and vorticity concept. So the vorticity concept really helps us to understand the movements and to uh, to describe the movements in the ocean, but also in the atmosphere as well. We have now the potential vorticity, the term which is called potential vorticity, <laughs> which is conserved like an angular momentum, but applied to a fluid instead of a solid. So you can, uh, and potential vorticity is planetary vorticity plus relative vorticity plus column, column height. Why is column height? So we have the planetary vorticity, relative vorticity, and column height. Why column height uh, influences the vorticity? Let's look at this. If this is the, that's the surface, and this is the, the bottom. Okay? Think about the water column which is here. and moves that direction. What is happening to the water column? The water column comes to this bump in the bottom, 
becomes wider and shorter. So we are e increasing the radius of the water column, decreasing the, 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 the uh, relative vorticity, and, uh, and changing, in fact, changing the vorticity is simply due to the fact that we have uh, the water, the, the uh, ocean depth is not constant. Okay? So there is a stretching or shrinking of the of the water column due to the gradient, horizontal gradient or depth gradient. So if H if H is not constant but is function of X and Y, in that case the vorticity, the, the, the relative vorticity changes is a function of, of H. Therefore, we have the potential vorticity, which is this, this term here, has in fact three components. One is absolute vorticity, then is relative vorticity, and then is the column stretching or squeezing due to the, uh, due to the, 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 the depth changes. <laughs> So the, the vorticity is one and two, they make a total vorticity. And the stretching height of the water column is in the denominator, since making a column taller makes it spin faster and vice versa. So the lower, the lower, the, the higher is water depth, the water column is uh, stretching and we are increasing the uh, we are uh, increasing the, the potential vorticity. We are increasing the, the relative vorticity because we are decreasing the radius and increasing the vorticity of the of the of the. So this uh, this is important term which helps us, which will help us to uh, interpret number of uh, of uh, phenomena what we have noticed in the in the ocean circulation. So this is the equation of conservation potential vorticity. Okay, the equation of the conservation potential vorticity, what it simply says is that the that along the particle path, this potential vorticity term is constant. This is a very, very important, uh, very important term, very important equation which determines the the behavior or or the pattern of the currents in the ocean. <laughs> Relative vorticity is usually smaller than the planetary vorticity. We are talking about the planetary vorticity is 10 to the minus 4 at our at our uh, um, uh, at our uh, latitudes and, uh, and this is uh, smaller than that except Except, for example, at the edge of uh, our western boundary current, where we have the very high relative vorticity, which is one meter per second over 100 kilometers. So we have the horizontal over 100 kilometers in the boundary current. We have the changes of the of, of the wind speed on the order of one meter per second, and so if you calculate the the the, um, the gradient of uh, of the speed, you end up with a 0.14 cycles per day, which is much larger than the than the relative than the than the uh, um, planetary vorticity. Usually, planetary vorticity is uh, two orders of magnitude, one or two orders of magnitude. Planetary vorticity is one or two large order of magnitude larger than the, than the relative vorticity, except, as it says here, except in the area at the edge of the western boundary. And you will see how this can be used to uh, to interpret this, uh, to to uh, describe the western uh, 
and intensification in terms of the cons conservation of the potential vorticity. Thanks to this fact that theta is much less than f, theta much less than f, we have d dt. Sorry, f of h is equal to zero. What that means? This is a very important. This very very, very important expression means that along the path of a particle, f over h is constant. Let's see what that means further. That means that if we have, uh, if we have the isobars, the particle will follow the isobars. That's a simply, simply, simply expression within, within the. Uh, Within the um, within the uh, on an F plane, right? So particle will try to follow the the, the 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 lines of equal density, or or F or H is constant. So or we can define the f over h lines, uh, isolines of f over h, which have at the same time trajectories of particles. Is that isobar or isoline? Excuse me? Is that isobar? No. No, they, these are the lines, the lines of, 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 of uh, constant f over h. These lines of f over h constant are, can be are in a first approximation the, the trajectories of particles. Of, of course, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, if theta, if the relative vorticity is smaller than f. Let's see what that means in, a, in terms of the uh, uh, here is the uh, <laughs> Here is something but uh, has to be also considered. This is the, uh, that's the relative vorticity. Um, if we have a relative vorticity, we assume that relative vorticity is, uh, is zero. Uh, if the particle moves northward, what's, what's happening from theta 1 to theta 2, we have the the, we have to do uh, the, the, the practically the, uh, the, 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 the vorticity changes or the changes the height of the water column. Since the uh, F over H is conserved, conservation of potential vorticity planetary and stretchy. The, the potential vorticity balance or called the Sverter balance for the large scale general circulation gyres uh, is this thing here. So the, uh, the V is the, vert the northward flow, the northward vel component of velocity. Beta is the horizontal uh, gradient of the F. So we are on the beta plane. If you move, <coughs> if you move northward, okay, so the F V is positive, then the vertical velocity is positive. So that means that we have the, 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 the stretching of the water column. And vice versa. And this is this is some this is very important a important relationship what uh, what has to be taken for large scale motions. <clears throat> here is the uh, here is the what I told you before the what is uh, what is happening if the particle uh, uh, me, uh, meet a ridge in the ocean. So the particle is moving this way. This is the depth shape. And the, uh, the particle is moving this way, uh, reaches this ridge. And how it would, uh, how it would, uh, uh, how it would uh, uh, 
you know, on which side it will pass the or, uh, near the ridge. So this is the ridge. Let me let me plot this way in order to clear you for you the, the, the question. If this is the ridge looking from up, the particle is moving this way. Okay? And this ridge means that the particle will be uh, squeezed. Okay? If it will be squeezed, we have to take into consideration that theta plus f has to be constant, right? f theta plus f over h has to be constant. The h is diminishing. The f, uh, the, the theta, will be decreasing. But the, uh, so the, the, this decrease, this decrease, and this also has to decrease in order to keep this constant. So that means that the particle will have to do the, the round, uh, the, the, it will pass around this, this ridge going southward, going toward the equator where f is smaller. So this is the, this, is, this means this equation f zeta plus f over h is uh, is constant. Zeta plus f over h. We have to go southward in order to uh, to reduce f because the uh, because the uh, and to keep this h constant since we have uh, decreased zeta. Okay, so this is the that's how we. Explain this. Uh, see, the, by this, but we are talking about the barotropic flow. Why we why we are saying barotropic flow? Barotropic flow means that the that the fluid is vertically homogeneous. So, whatever is happening at the bottom, the, the entire water column feels that. So we are squeezing the water column, and the entire water column feels what is happening. If the uh, the flow is not barotropic, so that means it's horizontal, it's vertically stratified, then the, 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 the entire water column will not feel what is happening there. Only part of the water column will feel. But in the case of the barotropic flow over the ridge, then the entire water column feels what is happening at the bottom. So uh, intuitively, this is the, uh, that's, the uh, that's for the barotropic, for the barotropic flow. The, uh, this is the this is similar thing. <coughs> <coughs> the uh, think about the uh, the uh, if you are uh, uh, in the coastal area, okay? There is uh, if there is a mechanism which pushes the water column from the from the coast toward the open sea. What is happening? The water column goes from a shallower over part to a deeper part. So we are increasing the height of the water column. So we are stretching the water column, adding the vorticity, the relative vorticity in our water column. And if the wind stops, the, 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 the water, the, the particle will try to, to, uh, to move back to the area where, where it started from in order to to uh, get to the, to the position where it used to be, where this original vorticity has. In that case, we uh, that there is a wind can induce the, the uh, wave motions where the particle goes back and forth from the uh, along the slope in the coastal area. You will see later that these are the Kelvin waves, which are generated by the wind. Uh, wind action which pushes the water column from the coast toward the open sea or vice versa and then the water column oscillates around the, the equilibrium and this, uh, this uh, results in a generation of the waves. Okay, so this is the, uh, you see this is practically yeah. similar to that, yes? It's not the same as the Rossby waves. Rossby waves are on the beta plane. And Kelvin waves are on, on, on F plane. Uh, I'm sorry, but can you distinguish between the two planes? 
F, F and beta. Yes. Uh, F, and F plane means F is equal constant. Section? No. Eh? Correlates? Yeah. Correlates parameter constant. Beta. Beta is, we have a DF dy. So there is a, there is a, so F is, a, here is F a constant. And here on beta plane, F is equal F0 plus DF dy. OK? So uh, developing in a Taylor series, we keep, you keep only the first, uh, the first term. And this is the beta plane, where you cannot assume that the f is constant. So when you are. So you multiply by the velocity, the f dy times the velocity. Excuse me? f not plus the f dy times the velocity. This thing here? Yeah. Well, the. No, it, we, I develop in, uh, in Taylor series f, which is f0 at the point where you are, where we are in, and then plus a certain distance and multiply the f dy. Uh, I simply, the, the, if, I, if I want to go further in the development of Taylor series, then I would go to second, third order term. But we usually stop at the first order term. And uh, when we are talking about the f, Plane, we are talking about the distances on the order not more than a few several hundreds of kilometers. When we are talking about an order of thousands of kilometers, in that case, we have to keep to talk about the beta plane. Okay? We have to take into consideration the north south changes of the, of the Coriolis parameter. That's the beta are you referring to F planes or beta planes? Yes. One is F plane. F plane when you assume that the F is constant. Beta plane when you assume that that the R F is changing uh, linearly from uh, yeah, from you know, as a function of y north south direction. <clears throat> and in fact. In fact, this, this thing here, the moving, moving of the oil particle in a north-south direction uh, uh, results in taking into consideration beta because the, you are, your movement north-south are large. And this is for the, for the large-scale general circulation. So that means that the, the circula general circulation on the order of thousands of kilometers. This is why we use this beta here and not F. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, associated with this is what we call Ekman pumping. Ekman pumping means that, <coughs> that the, the, the curl of the wind stress <coughs> generates the, uh, the, 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 the pumping of the surface water from the Ekman layer into deeper layer. Or Ekman suction. So that means the sucking of the water from deeper layers from the interior into the, into the Ekman layer. <coughs> and this this is the equation which gives you the 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 the, uh, the Ekman pumping, which is the proportional to the curl of the of the Ekman transport, and by definition, the Ekman velocity approaches zero at the base of the Ekman layer, and uh, so this this is zero due to the divergence of the Ekman layer must be zero. So this is the, that's how, how the Ekman pumping, what is the equation of Ekman pumping. And as a final result is this thing here, that the, 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 the Ekman pumping is, the, uh, is, proportional, is proportional to the vertical, to the vertical velocity. So the, uh, the Ekman pumping is, uh, horizontal divergence 
of the of the mass transport due to the Ekman to the Ekman layer. So if you have the, the divergence in the Ekman layer, then we have the Ekman pumping or sucking. If you have a convergence in the Ekman layer, if you have the convergence in the Ekman layer, I don't have it here, you have the Ekman pumping or you have divergence, you have the Ekman suction. Okay, what we that is what causes the yeah. upwelling. Right, upwelling and up. So is it like a force or um, is it a force? No, it's not the force. It's simply the, the this comes simply from the continuity equation. No water can be lost, no volume can be lost, no volume can be gained. Okay, okay so if you have the, <coughs> the loss of the water from the, from the uh, Ekman layer, this has to be compensated by the, by the flow from deeper layers into the Ekman layer, and vice versa. If you have the, uh, the convergence in the Ekman layer, so that means the accumulation of mass, this cannot go forever. So you have, to have, you have the Ekman pumping. For, to compensate for this accumulation of mass in the Ekman layer, okay? <coughs> so <coughs> here is the fine. This is the very, very nice and important equation. It says that the uh, Ekman pumping can be related to the curl of the wind stress. This thing here, you see. Here we have the. Uh, if this is wind, it's not the current. If this is the wind, we have the, uh, the we have the curve. This is the positive curve, okay? Since this is the positive curve, we have uh, having the positive curves. That means that the the wind is uh, generating the uh, in this case uh, generating uh, the, the convergence. By generating the convergence, generates the vertical velocity, the Ekman velocity from the Ekman layer downward. And this is the, that's what this uh, equation says, simply. The, uh, the, the curl of the wind stress generates the suction or pumping and also changing the, uh, the, the, vorticity, the relative vorticity, stretching or squeezing of the water column, convergence or divergence, okay? So, you know, this is all these, uh, these things comes to the same, to the same point, trying Collecting on uh, interpreting on one hand side from the from the vorticity equation on the other side, looking at the continuity of volume of the of the of the water. I think I will I will stop here and we'll continue next hour and then uh, by Friday I think we finish this part and then we'll go to instrumentation. Okay. Good. Sure. Am. <laughs> but if I press the button. <laughs>